We're going to look at the Day of Atonement, the mysterious goats. Uh, for the church service this morning, we're going to look at something that we didn't look at in Portland. It's called It Will Happen. And uh, it's something I put together over the last two days, actually. I started on it Wednesday and finished it uh, late Thursday afternoon. I'm not going to tell you what that's about, but it is connected to the Day of Atonement. And then this afternoon, we're going to look at time setting. Because here about uh, six to eight months ago, there were at least two and probably more uh, Seventh-day Adventist pastors who felt that God was telling them that uh, there was going to be a Sunday law in March or April of this year. And April's just about up. And uh, we're going to look at that this afternoon. We're going to look at that on time setting. Then after that, uh, if there's anybody still here, we'll have a Q&A. Okay, the mysterious goats. A child breaks mommy's favorite vase. Mommy forgives the little boy. But the vase is not restored by the act of forgiveness. When mommy says to the little crying boy, after he says, Mommy, I'm so sorry for what I did. Mommy says, I forgive you. Well, in that act of forgiveness, it doesn't restore the vase. It doesn't restore it. The consequence lives on. There's a consequence. It lives on. Until one day all sin will finally be dealt with. Now I'm not saying that this child breaking this vase was a, a, you know, a sinful thing. But the point being, there's a consequence and it lives on until finally it will be dealt with. Someone will bear ultimately responsibility for the sin problem. And that's the one who's responsible. But you know, throughout the Jewish year, within the sanctuary service, a person would come, they would confess their sins, the priest would then take blood from the slain, perfect animal, would then sprinkle it in the sanctuary, and thereby the sin was transferred from the penitent person into the sanctuary. And by that act, God was taking responsibility for the sin problem. Because that was his house. And he was claiming that responsibility. But you know, once each year, the one truly responsible for the sin problem was actually pointed out and was revealed on the Day of Atonement. You know, Noah Webster, of course we all have a Webster's Dictionary. If you look up what Webster says about atonement, Webster's will say it's reconciliation. And then the second meaning will be the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Reparation for an offense or an injury. Christian science, the exemplifying of human oneness with God. Folk, in our world today, if you talk to Noah Webster, of course he's dead, he was lived in the 19th century, but if you talk to theologians, scholars, both in Adventism and outside of Adventism, they will all say that atonement was done at the cross. And that's what Noah Webster said. That's what Desmond Ford taught, which just was devastating to the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's all over this idea of atonement. Now folk, let's face it, if atonement, if atonement was truly full, complete, and finished, 
when Jesus died, then we shouldn't be here today. There, there's no reason for a Seventh-day Adventist to exist. Do you realize that? You know, you say, well, I, what about the Sabbath? Well, folk, remember, Conrad Griebel started keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath during the time of Martin Luther in the 1520s. Okay, so, yeah, we brought it to the light of the three angels' messages from Revelation 14, but we didn't restore the Sabbath truth. It was restored in 1526. The state of the dead. You know, we say, well, you know, that's, that's why we were called to, to restore was the state of... No. The man who worked with Martin Luther and his name skips my mind again. No, it wasn't Melanchthon. It was the other man, Karlstadt. Karlstadt, that's his name. Karlstadt, by 1523, was teaching that when a person dies, he sleeps. So we were not raised up to tell the world what happens when you die, even though that's important. Folks, there's one doctrine we were raised up to share with the world. That's the sanctuary and the Day of Atonement. And if we think it was done at the cross, then why 1844? See, there's, there's a terrible dilemma there. And of course, Donald Gray Barnhouse in the 1950s and Walter Martin with Seventh-day Adventist leaders, they decided that the Day of Atonement and the investigative judgment was not a biblical doctrine at all, but it was actually the greatest face-saving device ever invented by humanity. Well, folk, is that what it is? If it is, then we, sh we need to know that and we need to find another church. Well, it, it clearly isn't the greatest face-saving device ever invented. Folk, the Day of Atonement is the only logical, reasonable, and beautiful teaching that makes the plan of salvation make perfect sense. That's what the Day of Atonement ministry does. Every other teaching on what happens after a person comes to Christ. Well, what did John Calvin teach? He said, some are predestined to be saved and some are predestined to damnation. So that was Calvin's idea once a person accepts, as Calvin taught, the atonement of Christ at the cross. That's what Calvin taught. The Seventh-day Adventist said, no, that's not right. That's not right. And then you come along years, years and years later, and you have the Baptists. And the Baptists say, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. So that was their answer to what happens after you accept Christ. Once you accept Christ one time, you're saved forever. See, and then you have the universalists who say because Christ died, every, everybody who has ever lived will be saved in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, none of those are right. None of those make sense. The only one that does is the Day of Atonement and the Investigative Judgment. It's the only one that makes sense. Throughout the Jewish year, a person could come to the temple, confess his sins, take the life of the animal, and the priest would mediate the blood in the temple, thus transferring the sin through the blood to the sanctuary. Throughout the year, sin remained in the sanctuary, but is God the one responsible for the sin problem? The Day of Atonement gives us the answer. The very thought that there is something more to the plan of salvation than the cross of Christ is utterly repugnant to most Adventists today. What a sad comment that is. But that's true. 
most Seventh-day Adventists today say Jesus did it all at the cross. Just accept that idea and we'll be saved. And that's the omega of apostasy, part of it. And most, if not all, evangelicals teach the same thing. Most want to believe that everything was done at the cross and we simply have to acknowledge that fact. If we believe that, then one might also believe that everyone would have to be saved because there's nothing left to be done. One might have to think again though because that would put Attila the Hun, Nero, and Adolf Hitler into the kingdom of God. Now Ellen White, who has been attacked and continues to be attacked and will be attacked, made a startling statement for a woman with a third grade education who doesn't know anything about theology, but she made a stunning revelation in the book Great Controversy, page 489. She said, the intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. By his death he began that work which after his resurrection he ascended to complete in heaven. In heaven. Now folk, in this statement, this woman with a third grade education said, that what Jesus is doing in heaven today as our great high priest is just as essential as was his death on the cross. So folks, she is saying that what Jesus did at the cross and what he's doing in heaven today are just as important in the plan of salvation. Now can we prove that? Is this provable? Well, I think it is. In fact, I know it is. From Leviticus chapter 4, verses 27 to 31. I want you to notice this. This was the gospel in miniature in the Old Testament. You know, in Hebrews chapter 4, Paul said, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, Paul said, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So the Jews knew the gospel. The Jews learned that God, the plan of salvation was right there in the Old Testament. The Jews knew it too. Well, where was it? Oh, it was in the sanctuary. It was in the sanctuary. And this was the process whereby a person could be reconciled to God. Here we go. Leviticus 4, 27 to 31. If any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and be guilty... Now there's a couple of things there. Number one, what was it that pointed out to people in the Old Testament their sins? What was it? What was it? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Now did, did things somehow change? It was that way in the Old Testament, but it's not that way now? No, it's still the same way. Notice a few passages. You know, people say that Paul was the you know, the antinomian preacher. Well, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Notice Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 15. Romans 4, verse 15. The Bible says, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, what's the Bible say? There's no transgression. If you take away law, if you take away law, there's no sin. If you take away the law, there's no sin. And if there's no sin, there's no need for what? A savior. So the law and Christ go together. You can't separate them. And if somebody tries to separate the two, 
You will either have a world of, of hateful, cruel, mean Pharisees that are law-abiding people as far as outward acts are concerned, but they're as hateful as the dickens on the inside. Or you will have a group of people that say, I can do anything I want and Jesus loves me and saves me. Now, folk, that's what happens. You get the two extremes if you try to separate the law and Christ. You know, Billy Graham, who um, Doug Batchelor and Steve Wilbur think was the, the greatest preacher of the 20th century, he actually was the greatest ecumenical preacher of the 20th century. Folk, what did Billy Graham do? Billy Graham preached a gospel it was, it was Jesus. Where was the law? Where was the law? There was no law. There was no law. And so Billy Graham's preaching, what the fruit of his preaching was, was a world that says, I just accept Jesus. And I can do whatever I want. And that's the kind of world we have today, isn't it, folk? I can do whatever I want, and I'm saved because of Jesus. And that was Billy Graham's gospel. So the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression. And when there is no transgression, there is no need for a Savior. Notice Romans chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is what? when there's no law. If there's no law, there's no knowledge of sin. There's no absolute. So it was the absolute authority of the Ten Commandments that pointed out to people in the Old as well as in the New Testament, sin. That's what it did. Going on, if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge... He shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he has sinned. Now there's a condition to that. A person brings his offering as long as he's not excusing the fact that he's breaking the Ten Commandments. You see, folk, we have become artful dodgers today. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Yvonne? That's what we are. See, God says, this is wrong. You're doing something that's wrong. And what is our response? Well, you know, it's really not me that's doing it. I, I'm doing this because of this person. I have done wrong because this person has hurt me. No. No. They didn't do the wrong act. You did. I did. Not the other person. You did it, and I did it. We need to come to grips with that. Folk, as long as we are making excuses and blaming somebody else for dumb things that we have done, we will never experience the forgiveness of Christ in our lives. Why? Because we will never need it. We'll never need it. We've got to be honest with ourselves. You know, we're going to talk about a guy during the church service today. Probably within the top five of the most famous Seventh-day Adventist ministers who have ever lived. Top five. And this man went so far away from the Lord. But you know what? He could justify a relationship with another woman and say, well, the reason why is because I'm going to be married to that person in heaven. That's called spiritual whiffery. One of the top, most famous Adventist ministers lived that lie. <coughs> Folk, we're diabolical. Let's just face the facts. We are diabolical if we're not honest 
with ourselves. We're diabolical. We're deadly. We're deadly. Spiritual whiffery. Wow. But these, this person was to bring an offering. A kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he had sinned. Had to bring a substitute. Couldn't bring works. Couldn't bring, you know, I've been a good guy. Couldn't bring my diet. Couldn't bring my clothing. Couldn't bring my tithe. No, I have to bring an offering. There's got to be a substitute. Because nothing that I can do, nothing I can do, can meet that standard of righteousness. Nothing. but I can bring an offering. I can bring somebody whose life, whose character is equal to that law. I can do that. And he was willing to step in for me. I can do that. And then I lay my hand upon the head of the sin offering and I have to kill him. I have to kill him with my own hand in the place of the burnt offering. And that's exactly what a penitent person did. With their own hand, with the knife in their own hand, they slit the throat of the innocent, of the innocent offering. That's what we have to do, folk. And hopefully, hopefully, in our taking the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, hopefully it will do something in each of our lives. Hopefully it will break, it will break the hardness of heart that we all possess and it will say, we will say, Jesus, save me from myself. Save me from myself. Now, folk, when the offering was slain, what did that point forward to? What did that point, what was it? The cross. the cross. It pointed forward to the cross, right here. The slaying of the innocent, unblemished sacrifice, that pointed to the cross, right there. There is the gospel that Paul said in Hebrews 4 was preached to the Jews, right there. There is the cross, right there. The sin offering is slain for the guilty party. That's the cross. That is the Bible at this point. Probably some of the modern translations say it. And slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering and atonement is made. Does your Bible say that? Does it? No, Webster said it should. And all, most Adventist preachers and evangelicals would say that atonement is made right there. Does your Bible say that? Atonement wasn't made there. Atonement was not made there. Going on. The priest shall take of the blood with his finger. Put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering. Shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. He shall take away all the fat thereof as the fat is taken away from the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him. And it shall be forgiven him. Who made the atonement? The priest did. So the work of the priest was just as important as a sacrifice, wasn't it? Just as important. If you didn't have sacrifice and mediation, there was no atonement. So what Ellen White said in Great Controversy, page 489, was absolutely correct. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above 
is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. This is exactly what Leviticus chapter 4 says. The work of the cross, the mediation of the priest, just as essential to take care of the sin problem, to make atonement for the person. The five-step process, knowledge of sin through the commandments, unblemished sacrifice, confession of sin, slaying the innocent, and the priest makes atonement. Atonement was not finished at the cross. There was need for atonement in 1844. There is still need for atonement today. Still need for atonement to go on right now. Christ's sacrifice was full it was complete and made forever sure that no other sacrifice for sin would ever suffice to put forgiveness within the reach of fallen man. But as great as Christ's sacrifice was, it did not complete the atonement. Didn't complete it. When Ellen White uses the words Christ's atoning sacrifice, she's not saying that the sacrifice finished the atonement. She's just saying that that sacrifice made it so there would be no need for any other. That's what she meant by that. It made forever sure Christ's death made forever sure that atonement would one day finally occur. That's what it did. Have you ever thought about in Daniel chapter 8 and 9? In Daniel chapter 8 and 9, Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, you have the concept, it says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days or evenings and mornings, however you want to say it, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now have you ever realized that it, from Daniel chapter 8, Daniel 8 14 was the only part of that prophecy that was not explained? The ram was explained, the he-goat was explained, the little horn was explained, but the 2300 days was not explained. And so then you go over to Daniel chapter 9, and Gabriel comes back. In Daniel 9 verse 22, he says, He informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Skill and understanding about what? About the 2300 years. Because he didn't explain it in Daniel chapter 8. And so then, to explain the 2300 years in Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel begins with another time prophecy. Daniel 9 verse 24, he says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So the Jews have 490 years to get things right. And those 490 years are cut off from the 2300 years. But then Gabriel says that within those 490 years, something would happen. Somebody would come who would finish the transgression. Somebody would come who would make an end of sins. Somebody would come who would make reconciliation for iniquity. Somebody would come who would bring in everlasting righteousness. Somebody would come who would seal up the vision and the prophecy and anoint the most holy. And who was it that came? Jesus did. And so Jesus' death in 31 AD made forever sure that there would be a final atonement in 1844. Folks, the two events 
are completely related, completely related, as Daniel 8 and 9 show. According to Webster, atonement was solely the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible and Ellen White disagree. I want you to notice a few Bible stories where the concept of atonement is brought to light. First is in 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 1 through 3. 2 Samuel chapter 21 verses 1 through 3. I want you to notice this. Atonement is anything that takes care of the sin problem. Anything. Sacrifice, mediation, and even in some cases, a javelin through the heart. Notice, 2 Samuel 21, 1-3. to Bible says there was a famine in the days of David. Three years, year after year, and David inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered, it's for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said to them, now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn to them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? Wherewith shall I make the atonement? that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord. Atonement? Is David talking about getting an innocent lamb and killing it? Is that what he's talking about? No. David says, we've got a problem in Israel. We've had famine for three years. And we've got to deal with this sin problem or God will not bless us. And so he turns to the Gibeonites and he says, What can I do? What do you want me to do? Now the Gibeonites' response was, they said, We want seven of Saul's male children in his bloodline and we're going to kill them. And they did in 2 Samuel chapter 21. Atonement folk was dealing with the sin problem. That's what it was. So anything, anything that takes care of the sin problem, that's atonement. That's atonement. I want you to notice, I didn't put this one up there, I don't think. In Numbers chapter 16, notice another Bible story. It teaches the same thing, folk. Numbers chapter 16. This is the story of the three men that went after Moses and Aaron's leadership, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And, of course, Korah and Dathan and Abiram were killed by a miracle of God. The earth was opened up and they and their families and everything they had were consumed along with the 250 other apostate leaders. The next day, the Bible says in verse 41 of Numbers 16, on the morrow all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Boy, that's not blindness. The people blamed Moses and Aaron for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram's death. Well, God wasn't pleased with that. The Bible says, verse 42, it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle. Behold, the cloud covered it, the glory of the Lord appeared. Verse 44, the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. At verse 46, Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly to the congregation. And what was Aaron to do? Make a what? Make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. Did Aaron kill a sacrifice? 
Was blood offered on an altar? No, it wasn't, was it? Aaron sprinkled incense. And what did Aaron make by sprinkling the incense? He made atonement. So folk, again, atonement is taking care of the sin problem. Is there a sin problem in our world today, folks? Yeah, there is, isn't there? Atonement has to still be going on. If it isn't, we have no hope. One other story in Scripture, Numbers chapter 25. This is the story of Balaam. Children of Israel on the borders of the promised land, just like we are. Balaam wanted to deceive and destroy God's people. We see Balaam at work today, don't we? Through ecumenism and, and multitudes of Bibles and, and salvation and sin and all the rest of the apostate teachings. But when all that didn't work, Balaam sent in the Midianite women. Remember the story? Yeah. Just about destroyed Israel. 24,000 people died that day. Well, one of the Israelites, he was from the tribe of Simeon, he decided he was going to bring one of those women into the camp of Israel. Numbers chapter 25. Let's see, what was his name? His name was Zimri. Numbers 25, verse 14. Zimri, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites, the Bible says, brought this Midianite woman right into the camp of Israel. And there was a plague started. And so one of Aaron's grandsons, his name was Phineas. Phineas took a javelin and he headed straight for Zimri's tent. And he marched into Zimri's tent and he pinned Zimri and the Midianite woman to the ground. Killed him. Now the Bible says in verse 13, he shall have it in his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Talking about Phineas, he was zealous for his God and made a what? He made an atonement. Did he kill a lamb? No, he didn't kill a lamb. He killed these people. He took care of the sin problem in the camp. The Bible says he made atonement. David and Phineas took care of the sin problem in the camp. So did Aaron in number 16. Anything that has part in taking care of the sin problem is part of atonement. It's part of atonement. Now, how about on the day of atonement? There were two goats, remember? There was the Lord's goat, and what was the other one? It was Satan. It was Azazel, the scapegoat. Do you realize that on the Day of Atonement, which of those two goats makes atonement? Come on, help me. The one for Christ. The one for Christ. You're wrong. I'm sorry, sir. I appreciate you, you speaking up. Really. <laughs> He was part of it. He was part of it. So one, wasn't one goat for the Lord? Yeah. Absolutely it was. And he... So that wasn't Christ. The goat represented Christ in what you're saying. Well, what I'm saying is, is both of them made atonement. Yeah. They both so made atonement. In Spanish Bible, Azazel is a name for Satan. That's exactly right. Does the devil or Azazel make atonement? Now, now let's think about that for a minute. I appreciate, what's your name? Uh, Dean, Dean Paddock, I'm Dean Paddock's son. Dean, okay. 
I appreciate your comments, Dean, very much. Very much. This, this is critical, folks. This is critical. Two goats on the Day of Atonement. The Lord's goat is slain and makes atonement. Okay? Azazel is not slain. But the Bible says he makes atonement too. That's what the Bible says. Notice Leviticus 16, 7 to 10. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat, or Azazel. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to do what? Make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. You see, folk, if, if, our, if our concept of atonement is simply the sacrifice of Jesus, then what do you have here? The devil it becomes what? The devil becomes a savior. That's what he becomes. And in fact, back in 1977, let's see, how many years ago is that? 42 years ago. My dad, college professor, he was petrified because he had a son who was studying the Bible with Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, what time? What time is it? You've got all day. Um, so, so my dad, he, 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 he takes me, he actually has my sister, my older sister. He says, Deb, you take Bill to a deprogrammer. This, he, he has lost his mind. And so one night my sister took me to a deprogrammer. I'll never forget the guy's name. It was Eric Greasehopper. I mean, how do you forget a name like that? <laughs> so for four hours that night, Mr. Greasehopper was telling me why I should not be studying with the Seventh-day Adventists. They were following a, a woman who, you know, had mental issues, uh, and a farmer who, who didn't understand the Bible. Um, they believe in these wacky ideas like uh, investigative judgment, and they even think the law is still binding. Well, folk, for four hours, he's going over this with me. And at the end of the night, I looked at him, I said, Mr. Greasehopper, let me tell you something. I said, you know more than I do. I said, I've been studying with the Seventh-day Adventists for four months. I mean, come on, he's been studying about cults for 40 years. I said, but I'm going to tell you something. What I am learning as I study the Bible with this Seventh-day Adventist minister, I can see it. It's right there. And I said, Mr. Greasehopper, I can't answer all your questions. But I said, as long as in my studies with these Seventh-day Adventists, I said, if I can see it in the Bible, I said, Mr. Greasehopper, you can stand on your head and turn green. And I'm not going to change my mind. Well, that failed. My dad was fit to be tied. He, he looked at me one day. He said, son, he said, you're brainwashed. Now, for coming from a man who I loved and respected, that broke my heart. It broke my heart that my dad would say that to me. It still even makes my eyes water. 42 years later. Well, my dad had a brother. He was an evangelical, lived in Southern California in uh, Whittier Heights. And my dad and his brother, they could never talk religion because my uncle would stuff it down my dad's throat. And my dad would never talk to him about religion. 
But you know what? When it came to dealing with little Billy, my dad got on the phone and, and called his brother and said, Cecil, Bill has is, is gone off the deep end. He's, he's studying with these Adventists. He said, send me whatever material you can. So my uncle sends my dad a book written by a man named Anthony Hoekema. You can, it's right there online. It's still there. But he, he wrote a book about cults. And he talks about Seventh-day Adventists. And he said, those Adventists, they're a cult. And he said, they are so crazy. They believe the devil is their savior. And I looked at that because, you know, I mean, you know who my dad gave the book to once he read through it? He gave it to Billy because Billy needed to be straightened out. And so I'm reading through and I see this page in Hoekema, this scholar, he says, the Adventists don't, don't even understand atonement. They, they believe the devil is their savior. And I'm going, oh, come on, that's ridiculous. Well, why did he say that? Because he didn't understand atonement. Didn't understand atonement. Atonement is not just sacrifice. Atonement is mediation. Atonement is doing anything that takes care of the sin problem. That's atonement. And on that basis, folk, 1844 shine so beautiful that Jesus is taking care of the sin problem in the sanctuary in heaven today. That's what he's doing. That's what he's doing. How do we, how do we um, connect? Because the, you know, the, the revelation says that Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire. It's correcting. How do we equate the lake of fire with being uh, put out into the world? Well, Dean, what, what you've got there is, <clears throat> Dean, once Jesus comes, you've got the thousand-year millennium in Revelation 20. At the end of that time, then you have Revelation 21, or Revelation 20 still. It's still Revelation 20. Then you have fire come down and consume them. Dean, within that scenario, during the thousand years and... When the devil is finally destroyed. The millennium is the, is the wilderness, is what you're saying. Correct. Okay, and, and that's, uh, I was kind of thinking that too. <laughs> See, Dean, in, it, in its broad spectrum, atonement is taking care of the sin problem in the universe. Mm -hmm. Atonement ultimately will not be finished until the devil and all of his followers are destroyed. Because it's only then that the sin problem has been eradicated from the universe. Then atonement is finished. That's when it's finished. Okay. We know from Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, the Bible says you were perfect in your ways till iniquity was found in thee. Folk of atonement is taking care of the sin problem as the Bible says. And sin originates with the devil. He has to be part of the atonement mm -hmm. because he is the sin problem. Of course, there's the scapegoat. We'll close with this one. While the day of atonement for God's people will conclude at the close of probation, it does for us at the close of probation. Because the sin problem has been dealt with in our lives, atonement ultimately will not be complete and final until after the millennium when the devil, his angels, and his followers are destroyed. Then the sin problem will be totally dealt with. And his name, 1 9, says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction or sin shall not rise up the second time. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing plan uh, to forgive and to restore in us 
your character. We just pray for the Holy Spirit to overshadow and empower us to allow you to live out your life within us. In Jesus' name, amen.